This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. First of all, thank you so much for deciding to spend uh, your interneting time with this conversation. Um, For all the years I've been doing this, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be doing it. So thanks for having me in your earbuds or your car speakers or your USB speakers or your uh, laptop speakers or whatever device you use to listen to me. Um, Can you tell I'm tired? Can you tell it's been a long week? (laughs) I've got a lot going on um, with the family, with freelance, with school, the end of the quarter, looking at portfolios, um, blah, blah, blah. But uh, Thomas Kemeny? Yeah, nailed it. Yeah. I I, I tend to always rehearse the last name before we start. And uh, Kemeny, um, I did not do (laughs) Didn't do it. But um, is here today, as you know, you saw it from the description of the show, but Thomas is a copywriter. Um, currently self-employed, freelance in New York. Um, he has worked at Crispin, Porter, and Bogusky. He has taught at Miami Ad School in San Francisco. He has worked at Goodby Silverstein and Partners. He was at Goodby Silverstein and Partners for, for five and a half years. He's also worked at Mother in New York, 72 and Sunny, Anomaly, and um, like I said, is currently freelancing. The list of awards and other nice things is a nice list. Um, the awards include Grand Clio, Gold Andy Award, Gold Effie, uh, DNA D Pencil, um, some silvers and merits at the One Show, a finalist at the One Show, Can Lions, Art Directors Club, is a Bronze Young Gun, FWA, New York Festivals. I'm not even reading all of them. It's an impressive list. And he wrote a book. And um, part of part of this part of my mindset right now is a little bit of a, a little bit of envy slash jealousy at the guy who had the uh, the patience and focus to put down ideas in a book form that's actually really good. And I had a feeling this morning when I woke up that I was going to have to have this conversation having not read the book. And I haven't read every word in the book, but I read a lot of it this morning. That's and awesome. and uh, it's awesome, you guys. It's called Writing Your Way Ahead in Advertising. Um, there is a link to the Amazon page on the podcast Facebook page. So all you have to do is go to facebook.com slash DGMS podcast, which you should have already liked. And right there, I've already loaded in a way to buy Thomas's very easy to read, very informative and educational book, which I think is a great tool for any creative, especially young writers. And um, he just uh, stood in front of the school and talked to the students about things. And I got to say, it's always really interesting to me every week when a speaker comes here to take the sort of temperature of the building after the conversation to see if people kind of calling douche on the person or like if they're like inspired or they're just not talking about it and getting out for the rest of their weekend. And there were these little sub conversations in the halls everywhere about how do I become a better writer? How do you do headlines? How do you figure out how to uh, do the craft? And um, the conversation, which often happens in class and was happening today a lot with me in the hall was, and I want to talk about this with Thomas, who hasn't, you haven't heard his voice yet, is, de- <laughs> I don't have a voice. is de-emphasizing, um, I think I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, but de-emphasizing the value of an idea to understand that ideas have no value without the expression of those ideas and that you're pretty much as a writer hired for that expression, if not more, I mean, if not at least as much as the idea, more than for the idea. So I don't know if you're, Thomas is nodding a little bit. Thomas, yeah. welcome to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I should set this up with, I'm, I'm in somewhat of an introvert, so I've spoken more today than probably the rest of the year, but uh, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying this. This has been fun. Is that, do you think that's ever hurt you? Well, that's the thing about an introvert is you can hide behind uh, typed slash printed slash typeset words, right? That's it. I, had, I mean, that, um, you know, I was talking to somebody when, when I uh, was talking about this book once and uh, I think the way that I sort of talk to people is through my work in a way. So this mm-hmm. is this book I think does a good job of expressing all the all the stuff that's going on in my brain uh, when I sit quietly. But um, 
uh, but it's nice to be talking about it as well. And I do want to correct. It's Junior is the name of the book. And it, oh, uh, God. Writing, writing Your Way Ahead in Advertising is the, the subhead. The subhead, yeah. I'm sorry but, about uh, that. No, yeah. no, no. My as bad. long as people buy it, I can call it whatever. The book is called Junior. <laughs> the book is called Junior. And that was just a complete... I, I knew that and screwed up. I mean, look, I make mistakes. And uh, um, I edited a lot of them out. <laughs> um, you remind, you, so we started playing the name game in the hall. And we, we both are friends with uh, Mark Sobier. Yeah. I would say that guy's an introvert. I would say so, yeah. 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 He's yeah. got that same kind of thing. I think he's, we we vibe because of that. Yeah. And he's very, um, he has a powerful sort of brain working behind some sort of uh, a fence. And uh, <clears throat> I love the guy because he's like, you may be the same way. And this is something that I'm only mentioning this because I think there's value to this insight, is that Mark is a guy who finds an outlet for what's for natural frustrations. He's so nice. And he's such a positive guy and so sweet, but like nobody is always happy and advertising is not always kind to you. So I became friends with, with Mark 25 years ago when we lived in New York and worked together at Ogilvy and we would go play FIFA soccer on the old original PlayStation on a multi-tap with eight people. And there was the, the square button was like aggr- the aggressive foul button. It was pretty much guaranteed yellow or red card if you get a guy with that. And we just called it the Sobie button because he <laughs> would just go out and he, he, he thought every video game, no matter what the context of the video game was, was a fighting game. So he figured out in the racing games how to wreck, wreck other people's cars. And it, somehow I think it's... do you Okay, so this is a question. I figured out a way to make this into an interview <laughs> question. Is... Do you think it's important because you can't be this deep into your career and not have had frustrations and aggravations in the, in and a lot of killed work and that kind of stuff? How do you handle setbacks and do you have a release in your life to 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 kind of exercise your introvertism and frustrations? That's interesting. I mean, I think uh, I mean creativity in general is a bit of a the channeled frustrations. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I. I occasionally occasionally uh get upset uh, i mean I, I get upset but occasionally i let it out um and i've had people say um oh i, I don't like seeing i don't like I don't seeing angry, angry thomas and mm-hmm. i never want to see that again it makes me so sad um mm-hmm. so i think uh i think because i sort of i think it's one of those things too where it's like it's such a uh it's a restrained tool so when when it comes up you're like oh okay this is serious let's get our shit together mm-hmm. um so yeah yeah, so I'm going to go back to what we, what I was talking about at the beginning and ask you ask just kind of brainstorm this for one second. So uh, ideas are important. I think you should hunt for that for a few minutes. If you and I were going to design a class teaching sort of people how to ideate and how to create, is the emphasis how do you emphasize the idea part of it versus the craft part of it. So the way that I do my intro to teams class is the first week is kind of just coming in with ideas that have maybe some rough direction of execution, Mm -hmm. but shouldn't, do you think that more time should be spent on the craft on writing? And if you're given, if you're given a hundred hours, how does that, how does that break down? You know what I mean? Um, I think I've, I've never, uh, I think part of my reason I've been in the industry for a while and I think um, and this is just my own personal thing so maybe everyone's is different is I think the way that I've been able to stay in it for so long is because I've been sort of a very focused on the craft and Mm -hmm. as the the media has changed it's not thrown me off because I was always into the the writing part of it and Mm -hmm. so if I'm writing for digital or TV or experiential or uh, whatever it is I I, it didn't matter Um, I think the other thing is there's when you can't solve the problem, sometimes you can just kind of write your way out of the problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it, there's the, it is a sort of emergency parachute as well when you're just totally stuck and say, like, whatever, let's just restate the strategy, but better. That's um, exactly right. And that's yeah. interesting you say that because I was explaining that to someone earlier about how do you come up with ideas. And one method is sort of the my map word association and one to me is my method has always been just restating the strategy in a completely new or different way there was a writer here who graduated a long time ago and as an instructor and as a creative director thinks people have to kind of be, keep their eye open for this because she was so good she could write herself out of anything to the point where you could be fooled and think there was something there yeah so it's like yes that's really smartly said but you've said something not compelling well 
So, <laughs> so there, there's a bit of there is a bit of a thing where you still have to have the idea behind it. Um, yeah, uh, my partner and I we have this this kind of running joke about those types of things where we say, uh, we're like, it's not really a load bearing idea. Like, uh, if, you exactly. know, feel scratch at it a little bit, or like, oh, we have to change one word in it, and the whole thing collapses. You're like, yeah. That's not really going to work. That's, but you know, every now and then, one of those those non load bearing ideas just they are executed perfectly and they're great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, there's a student named Node who in the hall said, "You can you can do a podcast." I said, "Yeah." Do you have a question for him? He's like, "Um, no, yeah." Ask him what makes a good partner because he's an art director. So oh. what do you look for in a in a good collaboration with a partner? Ooh. Uh, my partner's awesome. His name's uh, Josh Engman, uh, and I've been working with him for. Um, well, we were a mother together for three years and now freelancing together for three and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think what works well is we're very, very opposite in a lot of ways, like in our personality and our approaches to life. I think he's a, he's a, um, an extrovert who wants to be introverted. And I'm sort of an introvert who wants to be extroverted mm-hmm. in a way, which is sort of, yeah, you know, he's, he is the center of attention, but doesn't like it. Uh, and I'm sort of quiet to myself and I, you know, I want more, more attention. Um, this is getting very, very sophisticated. No, I think uh, that's, no, I, but, I, but, so I think I have, I, yeah. I've had relationships like that. Before. Yeah. But I, I think works really well. is like, he's, uh, so despite being very opposite in our kind of like lives and how we, you know, how we think about things. Um, we both are very, uh, logical in a way to the point where we don't, we don't, argue of this is a good idea so we're going with it we never say that we just we talk it out and then we get to the point where i'm like oh okay i understand what you're saying yes that's correct or oh you're correct that's not the correct answer (laughs) that's interesting Uh, it's fascinating to me to hear you say that because a lot of times i've had conversations in this room on this podcast with people who are partners or even people just this conversation about partners and they always they often will attribute their success to the fact that they are the same, that they laugh at the same jokes and think the same way, maybe came from the same part of the country or grew up in the same time. And I, I actually think it's interesting to hear you say that you guys are so different. I think that's probably even more valuable if you can find the common ground, but each of you bringing a different diverse yeah. sort of way of, of solving things. Yeah, and I mean, we do sort of have the... Uh, we do have the same taste, I guess, in some ways, but um, yeah, it's, I think it works really well for... Um, for us that the, the common ground that we have is we're just so not at all about who solved it, who was right. We just have none of that. We're just, we are so like almost clinical, clinically cold about, is this the correct answer or not? And when that's we have great. the correct answer, we stop. <laughs> you know? I think that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, so I want to talk about a couple things from the book. So first off, the very beginning of the book is a whole sort of how you got into the business, uh, <laughs> relentless email conversation with the recruiter at Crispin Porter and Boguski. Yeah. And it's entertaining reading and it's um, almost voyeuristic and in, in, in like you can taste the desperation, but the creativity and the desire, which I think was just really, really, really cool. And uh, it, it shouldn't demonstrate a roadmap for a student of how to get a job other than the fact that you have to be inventive and relentless and you have to have persistence and you have to have some energy that things aren't just going to happen for you. Not that here's how you do emails, but here's the kind of level of commitment you have to have to getting in. Yeah. Here's my question. So after all of that, almost what apparently comes off in the book is singular focus again to Crispin Porter and Boguski. How was Crispin Porter and Boguski <laughs> when you were in there? Were you were, oh, was man. it everything you dreamed it was? Was it was it harder, worse, better? What were the surprises that I guess we can make it in a way that's not going to throw yourself under the bus. No, but what were surprises there that you didn't anticipate? I mean, I so I didn't go to. Um, I'm saying it's public on the podcast. I did not go to a portfolio school. So, uh, but my portfolio was garbage because of that. So I went to um, when I went there. That became my portfolio school. And from in the four months that I spent there, I would completely thrown out everything I did in school. Had a, a full new portfolio. Some of it actually produced work. Um, did and, you put dead work in your book at that point? Uh, no, I, after that, well, I guess I had, yeah, I did have some spec stuff mm-hmm. from, from internal meetings and things mm-hmm. like that, but yeah, nothing that didn't go to the that's client. That's great. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, oh, nothing was, that didn't go to the client. Yeah. Okay. Cause I think, I think at my first job we had some stuff that didn't even make it out of, didn't make it to a meeting that we still thought was good enough to put in our books. Uh, interesting. I think that, well, at that time, um, Alex, Alex Bogusky was personally had to approve everything that went to the client. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
Um, and I don't know what the situation is there now, but, um, what year was this? 2005. Okay. Um, so heyday, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was really, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it went to the client, I was like, that is good. <laughs> and at that point I didn't care if they made it or not. It was like somebody, somebody had approved it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah. And then, uh, so actually I got a funny story. So when I first was down there, I got there a few days ahead of, uh, starting my internship and they were in this like weird mall thing in uh, uh, Coconut Grove, and their offices were on the second floor of it. So I was walking around the first floor, and I saw this circle of people of like all these you know kind of uh, maybe high school, college looking people. But I just sort of you know I, I assumed they were just young creatives, and they were uh, playing hacky sack or something, and like playing some game where every time somebody got the hacky sack, they like had to say something. I'm like, this is so cool. I can't believe this agency. This is amazing. Like, this is how they concept. And no, it was a summer camp. It had nothing to do it with the agency. Is. That was, that was yeah. literally a summer camp. That was literally a summer camp. And then, you know, you get in, and, and I think this is sort of universally true of, of any agency. You, you get in, and people are at their desks working, and that's it. And uh, yeah, right. and there's so much, uh, you know, it's there's obviously culture and other things within the agency and how people treat each other and all these things that are very, very kind of, um, you know, palpable as you're walking through different places. But for the most part, it's, it's people sitting at their desks having ideas. Yeah. And, uh, so from there you were at, um, see, this is the thing. This is, this is, <laughs> you went to Goodby Silverstein and partners and, um, yeah. got to experience the generosity, the genius of the, of the, the partners at Goodby Silverstein and partners. And, um, Talk a little bit about how that was different and how the experience it could be informed your own creative process. And, uh, be, and before you do that, yeah. I want to ask you, um, do you consider yourself in some way a self-taught writer or do you, do you feel like you uh, learned okay. from creative directors? That, I mean, you didn't go to ad school and ad school to me, is, it's kind of educational. It's kind of just at bats. It's kind of just figuring out your own rhythm, your own way. So do you kind of feel like you're self-taught? Do you, uh, to a certain extent or, or what? I think, uh, I mean, I think so much of it comes down to exposure of just what you're, what's around you and what you experience. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't, you know, I don't, Jeff Goodby didn't teach me to write. He didn't sit down with me and say, okay, here's how you do a headline, but just sort of seeing how he writes things and how he, um, whether that's an article or a headline or how he approaches something. Uh, I mean, it's hard not to, not to take away something when you the see The cool it. thing about Jeff's writing which I think is the, is, is the mark of good writers, is that you feel like a person, as you're reading it, is talking to you. Like, yeah. you feel like there's a guy right there. You can hear his voice, and you can see his eyes looking at you, not to, just because we know him as a person, but there's something about the... There's a there's a light, a levity to the rhythm of his writing yeah. that, that seems very human. Yeah. And I, and, I mean, him for sure, it was unreal work. I mean, <clears throat> being there with him, but, um, well, you know, with him looking at my work, uh, on occasion, but there are also just so many creative directors and ACDs. A lot of my ACDs now are running agencies. Mm-hmm. Mark Sobia, for example, was a, an ACD at the time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, yeah, there was, uh, I mean, it was, Good people. yeah, it was, it was like, you know, uh, it was like watching the original NBA, like dream team all, all together, all these superstars together. And I'm just like some kid on the bench and they're like, do you want to throw the ball around a little bit? Right. You know, were you, were, you so in, like, were you intimidated? Were you enthused by it? Like, uh, I was, I was definitely intimidated, but, but in a, I think in a good way where I was excited to try and prove myself and to, you know, dig my heels in and say like, I'm going to, I'm going to solve this. You're going to, you're going to like what I show you, even if I have to mm. stay here till 4am to get there. Mm. Well, you're smart. I want to do a couple things. I want to, yeah. I want to open up the book. And I want to read. I want to read this one part. All right. All right, this is what I want to do. So this is this is this is the art for which we will make money. And this is what I want to do. I want to read your setup, boring headline, and I want you to read the way you should have rewritten it. Okay, we're going to do that for a couple of these. Okay. All right. So the headline says, "Fast has a new name." Okay, so that's the strategy. You got to say it's fast. Yeah. But what, what's the better way to say that? Fast has a new name, and it's Walter. We're very Walter. That ad ran, didn't it? <laughs> that ad ran. Yeah. All right, so let's look at on, on page uh, 52. Headline, a color printer for the price of black and white. Millions of colors for the price of two. 
right? See, this is how head, this is how writing is supposed to work. <laughs> All right, and the last one is this is a, this is this is close to me now because I'm actually writing a diversity ad for a client for freelance. So the headline is: As a company, we're proud to support diversity and individuality. So what's a better way to say that line? Never hide your true identity unless you can fly or bend steel. Right. That's so good. <laughs> Thanks. That's so good. Thank you. So here's, here's the thing about this. This is where money happens in writers' bank accounts. And I'm in the hall talking to some copywriters after forum. And I think that people are confused because they think that the setup part of that line about how powerful diversity is, is it, that's the ad. That's yeah. the message, yeah. right? Done. I got the idea there. Everyone knows what it is, yeah. Right. And then you iterate and iterate and rethink and rethink until you actually can get to a place that's so much more powerful. And one thing that I think is the most f- frustrating part of being a teacher, and I'm wondering if you experienced this as a teacher at Miami Ad School in San Francisco, um, students looking for a formula or a way, a roadmap to coming up with ideas. Do you think there's such a thing as that? Hmm. Um, I think every project you kind of have to approach on its own. Sometimes you just, you know, you think about the brand and you just, I I mean, I always, I always, when I get stuck, just think about like truths of the category or the product or like, Mm -hmm. and I don't mean like product features, like, you know, um, whatever the the car has horsepower. I think it's, you know, it's about why does that matter to me? What are truths about why people buy cars or, um, what's a a layer deeper? Um, and I think just writing those out, a lot of times your brain just starts, just starts working. Right. It starts to work. (laughs) Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Now I I understand. I'm, those are the things I want to talk about. Um, and then in a lot of ways I think of, um, of advertising and writing, especially it's, it's just problem solving. Um, and kind of in the same way that whether you build apps or, you uh, make burritos or whatever it is, you're sort of your, your problem solving. And in this case, it's any problem that can be solved with a word or an ad. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what you do. And, uh, and if your words or your ad doesn't solve the problem, or if you can't define the problem that you're solving, uh, then you kind of, you hit a wall. Well, the cool thing about your writing is that it leaves, it leaves that little, this analogy never made sense to me as a student. I can't understand it exactly. It, it leaves the circles partially open. It's not completely done. All the information isn't there. And I think you actually talked about that a little bit in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, when I talk about that, I think I think of it more in a way of like, um, it's is something like percolating. Yeah, I hear that too. Listeners, we're hearing something. I'm, I'm picking, at first I thought maybe that was just in feedback in my recorder. There's some noise happening. It's you know, bubble, it could be, bubbling. Yeah, it could be heavy rain. Oh, wow. Cool. All right. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, listeners. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was talking about... Uh, oh, yeah. So, I think um, I, there's definitely, like, the, lead, you know, don't close the loop. Leave... What is the, what's the classic one? It's, like, uh, leave room for the for the mouse and the mouse trap kind of thing. Um, I always think about it as, like, if, if the line finishes at the period, it's, it's sort of... That's not great because you want people to carry it with them as they go to mm-hmm. buy the product or as right. they go to the store. Um, and... I like thinking about it as taking a really a ton of information and collapsing it down into this one line that when you read it kind of re-expands uh, and, and cool. reopens those worlds and then put you kind of left floating around in those worlds. That's really cool. Um, so you talked about, did you just mention a, a, an app that makes a burrito? Um, no, you didn't. <laughs> the, uh, but where do, cool. where do you think, uh, yes, yeah, just that'd be awesome. Where do you think craft, writing craft lives now? I mean, because print is sort of, I mean, I guess there's kind of print, but like, yeah. what, what are the kind of assignments that you have worked on recently where you feel like you've, you've been able to apply everything you've been doing for years as a, as a headline writer? Um, I don't think that headlines have gone away. I, and there's this, this weird thing that, you know, when digital first kind of took off, um, everyone said, oh, it's, you know, writing is dead, print is dead, uh, TV is dead. Uh, and now like, yeah, yeah, no, TV is dead. Now we just have... 30 second pre-roll right. videos right. and you're like, Oh, you mean, you mean a commercial mean a commercial. Right. Uh, and then similarly now it's like, Oh, we just, we have a, you know, Instagram post. That's just a, it's just a visual with a line, but it's, you know, exactly. but that's, that's a print ad. Like the, it, so kind of, yeah, I mean, it it's, it's difference. Of course, it's different of because it's different because you're writing captions versus leading with copy, but unless you leave with copy in an Instagram post, but yeah, it's, it's the same. It's, it's just re, What's the word I'm saying? Reapplied yeah. to, to new media. Yeah, and because I think in some ways, like you know, we we still have ears and eyes, and mm-hmm. 
that's still how we consume information and whether we're interacting with it or not interacting with it or engaging with it or not engaging with it. I think, you know, those, those are, those are things that are changing and how, how, how you engage with somebody or how much you have to engage with them is changing. So like the, how, how far you lean into the sort of story has to change a bit, but the, the basic format of, of words and visuals are still there. Mm-hmm. You did say in the book that it's not like we're not reading, we're reading online a lot of stuff every day. Yeah. We're, we're, we are reading. Online. I think this generation reads more than probably any other generation. I mean, they're constantly on their phone reading something. People barely talk to each other. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very reading visual. It's culture. new. Um, changing, changing gears a little bit. Yeah. So, I th- I, you know, I, I really have enjoyed reading this and talking to you today because I feel like um, we both have this love of language and um, I've often said that like, you know, your job as a writer is to have language bend to your will. It's a tool that you mm-hmm. use. Do you have desire as a, as a writer, do you have a desire to become a CD, a CCO? I mean, what are your sort of next phase, next phase after that sort of, um, well, it's funny when, cause when I first started out of my, I really was just so eager and, um, I wanted to be, you know, a creative director by whatever age I, I've, I've age that I've long passed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and now I just really like doing the work, which is why I went freelance. I really, I actually just really like doing yeah. it. Um, and I'm happy to keep doing that while I can. I'm sure at some point, um, you know, at some point I'd probably will want to make that transition be in a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, like a, a role where I can kind of train people around me. I mean, I think about like great, you know, some of the great agencies that, uh, started in kind of random towns or that from random people where they didn't have, they didn't hire the top people. They just turned the people who are around them into the top people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really cool. And I'd love to do something like that at some point. I wish I could remember who the guest was on the podcast years ago that said that he really wants to start to, to promote people financially to do the job that they want to do to say, you shouldn't have to double your set. You shouldn't have to make a 50% pay increase to have the title of creative director. If you're a great writer, I should give you that money to continue to be a great writer because there's a great value to that. And yeah. I can't, it, was a C, it was a CCO. Somebody big said that they really wanted to do that. But I can't remember who it was. But like, I always feel like people who are really good at their job end up losing that because there's a, there's a financial need or there's some other need for them to do it. And it's not really, that's not right. But whatever. Yeah. No, I mean, I... <clears throat> whatever. Well, no, it's like you think back to... Like what? Uh, like Bob Barry was a art director for ever, mm-hmm. and I don't think he. I mean, now he's and famous, age. right? And very famous, and yeah. was just doing that. So you mentioned that it's important for designers and art directors to be able to write. Yeah. I think so. Why and in what context do <laughs> are designers and art directors finding themselves writing? I think there's just a lot more overlap now in general, where writers have to have a bit of an eye because, especially now that everything's done in you know Google Slides or whatever, where mm-hmm. sometimes I'll have to find a reference image while my art director you know write, writes up a paragraph about something, and we just sort of or uh, or or you know vice versa, or um, I guess it doesn't work with the vice versa. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it works with vice versa, but I I know that there's a lot of a lot of art directors and designers are throwing things together that are, you know, internally for external meetings. And there's just, there's, there's not always a writer there to do it. Right. Yeah. And, um, it's just important. And I don't know, I think it's good to practice that. Yeah. <clears throat> right, I look um, and also like sometimes, sometimes the writing is, um, almost a design element to where it, it, it does have to kind of get stripped back a bit and it does become more of a, an art director's role, like exactly how to say it. Or describing something, how this, something visually plays out, like who should say, who should write that? I mean, a writer can write it, but they don't really know what they're trying to say. Right. I'm looking at this, there's like, there's all these great pieces of advice in here. I don't, I don't know how much of this I, that we needed to, to do, but I love this section here where you're going through these copywriter tricks. <laughs> um, you know, you find, find a well-known saying and twist it. I think that's pretty familiar. People, yeah, people do that. that. Be bland, then play with it. This great signal in Kansas City becomes Casey's drenched in our sweet and tangy signal sauce. See, this is this is the craft. Be bland, <laughs> then play with it. Isn't that yeah. what our job is? Yeah. <laughs> Take the crappy line from the creative brief and make it not shitty. <laughs> yeah. That's what our paychecks are paying us to do. Yeah, and with that, I mean, sometimes you change a word or two and suddenly it, it works. 
Um, right. The next one here, this is... Big, small, high, low. Should I read this? You want to read this section? Uh, <laughs> yes, this is going to be my, my PSA. Uh, big, small, high, low. Clients love this shit. It's cheap, but it works. Find some parallel you can make in the language between opposites. You can do this with just about any brief, any client, any offer. For example, a bank wants you to talk about their low interest rates on their platinum cards. Your line can be, small rates, big deal, or pay a little, get a lot. Right. Uh, if you're working on a car, you could say, roars like a lion, priced like a lamb, or giant horsepower, tiny price. These lines will almost always sell. And I should say, I kind of hate these lines because I know, because I know the trick a little bit. Um, and now that I've said it, you're going to see them all the time and you're going to hate them too. Um, but in a pinch, you've got an hour and client needs to buy something, go with the, uh, go with the opposites. Right. And th- th- here's the thing. This sounds like old school, but this is like the way that you can make language delightful. This is a way that you can make a message, um, not, entertaining is too strong a word because I'm not purely entertained by it, but it's 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 a way to, to be an advertising writer to say something in a way that makes somebody feel a little a little a little moment of happiness. Yeah, that, that you're not just saying buy now. Um, do you think that your height is an asset? <laughs> My height. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, not, it is not an asset when I have to travel because, uh, because I'm very uncomfortable and I land very, very cramped. Uh, but I always wonder that. I always yeah. wonder big, if a big guy is listened to more than, than not. Yeah. And since people can't see, I'm eight feet tall. Yeah. No, it's uh, he's almost <laughs> seven feet tall. Though. He's almost seven feet tall. Yeah. Um, Twelve feet. All right. So I assume that you've been out and about kind of trying to promote the book what Mm -hmm. what kind of responses have you gotten that have been uh surprising i'm 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 saying this this is sort of full disclosure to the listeners much of these conversations are my own therapy right because i know that i have an idea for a book and i want to know what it's like to go through this you've got this thing printed it's produced it's available on amazon.com it's called junior um what has it been like since it's come out? What what has the experience been like for you? Has it been fulfilling, rewarding, disappointing? What's it been like? Um, it's been it's been okay. So I shouldn't I shouldn't say that I'm surprised that it's going well, but I'm surprised it's going well. Um, uh, you know, I put a lot of time and effort into it, and part of me was like, I, I knew it was good, or at least I, you know, to it was to my standard. You believed it was good. Yeah, yeah, I believed it was good to my to my standard, but I, I didn't put it out in the world and it's it's been really cool to have a thing that's just been stuck in my brain now, stuck in other people's brains. Yeah, it's really cool. Who uh, designed it? Uh, my friend um Anna Kostnik, she's a um Hungarian friend of mine. Uh, and she's an amazing, amazing designer. Um, it's a really well designed piece because it, yeah. you hear the voices. The voices jump around the page, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah. She and the, the layout definitely works with, it. and the whole book is laid out. It's not just you know not just the cover. The whole thing kind of has a good good mm-hmm. flow to it. Um, uh, yeah, and it's just been cool, like uh, having people who I haven't talked to in years reach out to me because yeah. uh, you know I was uh, and and reaching out to people. Uh, you know, I was when I got quotes from people like uh, Paul Malmstrom. Uh, who is uh, who is running Mother? Um, I reached out to him and sent him a copy of the of the book, and he he was just so nice and so warm. And I mean, that's his personality as well. But it was just it was such a great feeling to kind of reach out back out to these people. And and you know, Jeff Goodby who wrote the forward for it. I mean, that was just that was really cool and really cool. Um, yeah, and I mean, I should list everyone, but I, I won't. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're on there. Yeah. Uh, they're on the book. You can see it on Amazon. But yeah, so, what? Um, I'll ask you the last question. I've been asking a lot of yeah. people. What? What personal trait of yours? What do you think it is about you? It, and and I have a couple of them written down. And I was curious about is success more labor than, than talent? But I want to know what it is about you that you think has served you well so far. Um, I think amnesia is my is my greatest <laughs> greatest trait. Where I will have a terrible meeting it will go so great so poorly and within an hour i've forgotten about it and i'm back to trying to solve it um which i guess that's huge yeah. that's another word for resilience but i think that's really good because that's that's i think is a is a horrible cross or pain or injury or whatever that people have a hard time getting over the set little set you, you Realizing it's a setback, not a failure. Yeah. And to be able to forget it and move on is a really good thing. Yeah. And I mean, I, it does hurt, and I do, you know, 
have all the feelings and take things personally and all that. But then I kind of, I just get over it and move on with my life. And yeah. All right. So if listeners want to reach you, how can they reach you? Uh, you can reach me at tkemeny at gmail.com. So it's T-K-E-M-E-N-Y at gmail.com. Tkemeny at gmail.com. That's the Google mail. That's the Google's mail. Yeah. You can reach me at Dan's podcast at mac.com. Same email. And check out the book. It's called Junior. Thomas Kemeny. You can find it on the Amazon uh, bookseller on the internet. You can just type in on your, you are in the browser in that little window at the top, a narrow one, just type in Amazon period C-O-M. And then search Junior Thomas Kennedy, and you'll find the book in there. You can purchase it; it'll be delivered to your house. It's in, in a lot of local bookstores too. If you want to support local books, oh, they have it. Good. Yeah, oh, that's better. Yeah. Um, listeners, thanks for listening. Um, we'll see you again soon. Um, until then, Thomas, thanks again, man. Thank you so much. Listeners, thank you. Bye.